Hello, hi everybody, welcome. Welcome to our monthly GROW webinar. Looks like a lot of you all have already arrived, so take a few moments to get comfortable and settle in. We're gonna get started here in just about four more minutes. So say hello if you all are here. I see Angie, hi Angie, good to see you. Hi Brenda, welcome everybody. Hello, hi Angela. Hi, Sherry. Hi, Jenna. Good to see you here as always. Hi, Carla. Hi, Maria. Hey, Sarah. Ah, Yura Susan, how are you? Good to see you. Hi, Susan. Hey, Steph. Wonderful. Lots of good familiar names are showing up. I love it when that happens. Good morning, sunshine, says Susan. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, I'm really excited today. You all can see that um, Lizzie is not here, so I'm filling in for Lizzie. More to come on that in just a moment. But we have a wonderful presentation that we have designed here today. I'm super excited to be um, to be here and to have the ability to listen to it myself. And we're going to kick that off here in about three more minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see a lot of good chats coming through. <clears throat> hey, Chelsea. What's up, my friend? Hey, lady. Hi, Christine. How are you? Come on in, everybody, get comfortable. A few more moments and we'll get started. Kimberly, Lexine, how are you? Bethany, what's going on? Hi, Bethany. What's up, B? Two more minutes and we'll get started. Two more minutes. Hopefully you all are excited about our topic here today. I know I'm really excited about it. Um, I'm just super pleased to be a part of it today and to be able to spend a little bit of time with you all here on this lovely Wednesday afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, Bethany is working on yet another fun compliance class. So fun in capital letters. <laughs> I feel you on that. Mm -hmm. Those are always fun. Yes. Hi, Maria. How are you? Come on in. Hi, Michelle. Great to see everybody today. There's Sabrina. Hey, Sabrina, how are you? Stacy Doss, what's up? I haven't seen you around in a while. You doing okay, Stacy? Wonderful. Teresa, hey, Teresa. Hi, Tamika. Wonderful. About one more minute, my friends, and we're going to get started. One more minute. So if you're just tuning in, come on in, settle down kick up your feet, get comfortable. We have a great topic here for everybody. We've got a lot more folks that are still logging in and get settled. So we're gonna give it a moment before we kick off right here. Hi, Teresa. Wonderful. Hey, Yvonne. Hi, Shree, how are you? Hey, Naomi. It's always so wonderful to log into any of our sessions because it's really cool to see how widespread everybody is. We have people that are logged in right now from all different parts of the nation. I love to see that and to have that ability to feel connected as a community, even though we're logging in through little cameras and things like that, I absolutely love it. So it's great to be here with each of you all here today. Keep coming. If you're settling in, kick up your feet, take a few deep breaths. We're going to get started here in just a moment. Hey, Eileen, how are you? Brooke, good afternoon. How are you? Hey, Claire. All right. Well, we are sitting at 
1101 Central Standard Time. Of course, it depends on where you all are located. Is everyone ready to get started? If so, send me a quick little chat message through the questions box. Just say, I'm here, Tiff. My cheeks are in the seat. I'm super excited to get going. Laura's ready to go. Awesome. There's Adriana, good, Kimberly, Sabrina, Angela, Karen, Heather's ready, woot woot, says Brooke, okay. Susan says, let's do this. Bethany is here, Melissa, good, good, good. Okay, well, let's go ahead and kick it off and get started because we definitely honor your time and I know you're excited to get into this great content today. So hi and welcome everybody. As you can see, today I am filling in for Lizzie to kick off our GROW webinar. She is actually traveling right now at this very moment as we speak and was unable to be present with us today. So in her place, I'm going to kick off our monthly webinar and I'm going to help to monitor all of your incoming questions so we can make sure that we get those addressed. So without further ado, we have an amazing topic lined up for you today. And today's webinar is a little extra special because it's brought to you by GROW as a collaboration of all guaranteed rate companies, ERGs, including GROW, LEAD, PROUD, and VETNET, and of course, all of our, our allies too. So I'm going to turn it over to our expert here in just a moment, which is the reason that you all are here. And let's go ahead and uh, get Ellie on our camera presence here today as well. Hi, Ellie. So Hi today there. we welcome Ellie Nieves. Ellie is currently Vice President and Assistant General Counsel, Regulatory and Legislative Affairs at a Fortune 250 company. She's also the founder and president of Leadership Strategies for Women, LLC, where she facilitates leadership development programs for women and helps companies develop more diverse, equitable, and inclusive workplaces that foster a culture of belonging. Ellie attained a BA in Communications from Fordham University and a JD from the Elizabeth Hobbs School of Law at Pace University. She earned her MBA from NYU's Stern School of Business with specializations in leadership and global business. And today she's here to talk to us about promoting equity and inclusion in the workplace. And she's also gonna share some actionable steps that lead to effective allyship. And I can't wait to hear all of these supportive tips myself. So Ellie, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Take it away. Thank you so much, Tiffany, and welcome everyone to today's session. I am so happy to join you today to talk about being an ally, promoting equity and inclusion in the workplace. We have a lot of great information uh, to share with you today. So please, uh, if you do have your worksheets available, please uh, bring them out, grab a pen, and throughout the presentation, please also feel free to post any comments or questions in the chat and my friend and colleague Tiffany will share those comments and questions with me. So as we kick off, I want to take the opportunity to wish everyone a happy Pride Month. Pride Month commemorates the uprising that took place at the Stonewall Bar and Restaurant in New York. And it was back in 1969, uh, and it's hard to believe now, but back in 1969, homosexuality was actually still considered a criminal offense. And the uprising really triggered uh, the liberation movement for the gay community. So today we celebrate the advancements of the LGBTQIA plus family, and we celebrate those who uh, continue to advance the movement. So happy Pride Month, everyone. So we're gonna kick off our discussion and talk about why being an ally is important. So why is being an ally important? Now allies are key to promoting equity and inclusion in the workplace. An ally is someone who uses their power and position to advocate and to create opportunities for others. And allies also put in the work to understand the barriers and the challenges that underrepresented individuals face and they use their social and their political capital 
to help those individuals advance. So I want to share a quick video with you um, so that you can get a better understanding of what it is to be an ally. Here we go. We're about to race. Everybody line up. Shoulder to shoulder. Take off your backpack. Basketball, line up. We're about to race. And we are we are racing for a hundred dollar bill. The winner of this race will take this. A hundred dollar bill. Before I say go, I'm gonna make a couple statements. If those statements apply to you, I want you to take two steps forward. If those statements don't apply to you, I want you to stay right where you're at. Take two steps forward if both of your parents are still married. Take two steps forward if you grew up with a father figure in the home. Take two steps forward if you have access to a private education. Take two steps forward if you had access to a free tutor growing up. Take two steps forward if you've never had to worry about your cell phone being shut off. Take two steps forward if you've never had to help mom or dad with the bills. Take two steps forward if it wasn't because of your athletic ability, you don't have to pay for college. Take two steps forward if you never wanted where your next meal was gonna come from. I want you guys up here in the front just to turn around and look. Every statement I've made has nothing to do with anything any of you have done. Has nothing to do with decisions you've made. Everything I've said has nothing to do with what you've done. We all know these people up here have a better opportunity to win this $100. Does that mean these people back here can't race? No. We would be foolish to not realize we've been given more opportunity. We don't want to recognize that we've been given a head start. But the reality is we have. Now, there's no excuse. They still got to run their race. You still got to run your race. But whoever wins this $100, I think it'd be extremely foolish of you not to utilize that and learn more about somebody else's story. Because the reality is, if this was a fair race and everybody was back on that line, I guarantee you some of these black dudes would smoke all of you. And it's only because you have this big of a head start that you're possibly going to win this race called life. That is a picture of life, ladies and gentlemen. Nothing you've done has put you in the lead that you're in right now. When I say go, on your mark, get set, go. If you didn't learn anything from this activity, you're a fool. So this video says more with its imagery than I can ever convey in words. And that's why I like to use this video. You know, perhaps you can relate to one of the runners who did get a head start and stood back while you watched others get ahead purely by circumstance. Or perhaps you can relate to one of the runners that did get a head start. You know, allies are those who have been given a head start, but create that opportunity to be able to help others to also get ahead. So if we look at this illustration, uh, we see three young people looking over a fence to watch baseball, a baseball game. And it further sets the stage for what we're talking about today, how effective allyship creates a bridge toward equity.
So to be clear, we're not talking here about equal opportunity. We're talking about equity. So just like the video, the depiction of reality uh, in this particular illustration recognizes that each person starts at a different starting point. And here the starting points are the different heights of each individual and how many crates or resources each individual has to provide a further height advantage to see over the fence. So equal opportunity, which is uh, labeled as equality in the picture, means that each individual is given the same resources and opportunities to succeed. In the picture, each person is given a crate of the same height. So despite the equal resources, because each had a different starting point, the crates still do not make up for the height disparity. But as we see in the illustration of equity, true equity recognizes that each person starts at a different starting point, and it seeks to provide each individual with the extra resources needed so that all can see over the fence equally. And in an ideal world, there is no fence because all barriers are removed, and that's when we achieve justice. So we hear all the time how important diversity and inclusion is in the workplace. But true diversity and inclusion is not about numbers. It's not about how many women, Black, Latino, Asian, or LGBTQIA individuals are in the room. It's about how many of them are advancing and have a seat at the table. So effective allyship is not about just stating your support. It's actually about taking action. Key to creating a space for advancement are the allies who open those doors, who advocate, and who work towards equality. So today, we're going to talk about five proactive steps that you can take toward effective allyship. If you're new to the concept of allyship, think about these steps as progressive or on a continuum. You can actually build on each of these five steps until, you be, until they become second nature to you. Uh, Tiffany, before I move on, are there any noteworthy comments or questions coming through on the chat? Yeah, that video that you shared, it seems like it really struck a chord with a lot of people. There's so much chatter that's coming through um, about, it looks like some people have seen the video before, which that's interesting too. Um, so yeah, I don't know if there's anything else that you're going to share that kind of relates to that video, but it seems like that piqued a lot of interest. So great job there. I'm glad, and I really love the video because it really does set the tone for what we're talking about today. And as I mentioned before, that video says a lot more than I can ever say in words because it really gives us a true sense of where we are. And if we can look at that video and use that as a starting point, it really makes us open to these next five steps that I'm gonna share with you today about how you can be an effective ally. So the first step in being an effective ally is to be a learner. And when it comes to being an ally, there is so much to learn and there's no shortage of resources that are available to you. I mean, you can just Google resources and you will have a ton of them come at your disposal. So basically, there is just no excuse these days for not doing the research needed to learn more about disenfranchised individuals or those who need advocates in their, in their, in their walk. So be a learner, start by doing research, you know, learn more about the history of disparities that different groups face. And if there's one particular group that you feel that you want to support, do the research, look up that particular group's history, learn about the disparities that they face. And don't expect to be taught. I think one of the things that we learned just a couple of years ago during the pandemic after the George Floyd murder was that a lot of disenfranchised, marginalized groups felt that they bear the burden not only of past discrimination, but also the burden of having to educate those who haven't experienced the same types of burdens, historical discrimination burdens that they have experienced. So if you want to be an effective ally, start by doing your own research and don't always expect to be taught. Take it upon yourself to use the tools around you to learn and to answer your questions. Read books about social justice and equity, attend online trainings and webinars the way you're doing today, listen to podcasts, or find reputable uh, you know, experts on social media that you can follow. And as you do your research, 
you will likely discover that you actually have to relearn how you see the world. And this learning might actually be uncomfortable for you. You will learn information that will challenge your perspective, but be open to the fact that others experience the world differently than you do. And believe others when they share their experiences and their accounts. Don't assume something couldn't happen just because you haven't personally experienced it. Listen and ask questions when someone describes an experience that you haven't had. And then don't just jump in with your own personal stories. Really listen. You don't always have to find a point of commonality with the individual who's sharing the story. That's often what forces us to also share an experience when we hear someone else's experience. Sometimes just being empathetic and listening and asking questions can be, can be really helpful in this journey. An effective allyship really does require that we be open to feedback as well, because we're gonna be constantly evolving in this journey and our thinking will constantly evolve. So learn how to listen and accept feedback. And as you learn, observe the dynamics around you. And today I'm gonna get you started with some of that research. Let's talk about women in the workplace. You know, research shows that women of color are up to four times more likely to face microaggressions in the workplace than are white women. Microaggressions are subtle acts of discrimination against marginalized groups. Uh, a common example that's often cited by women of color is that they're often told that they're articulate. I myself as a Latina have heard this. Someone has told me, oh, you're very articulate why would I not be articulate? It could be that they're asking that question because it's based on a stereotype that they have. And that's an opportunity to actually challenge themselves in asking themselves why they would ask such a question. But that question is an example of a microaggression. Another example of a microaggression is when a woman of color speaks up, uh, oftentimes they're being told that they're aggressive and they're often penalized for speaking up. Uh, however, when a man exerts the same level of energy, it could possibly be considered passionate. So another important statistic is how women are saddled with caregiving responsibilities, especially during this time in the pandemic. Uh, many women, especially those who are in that older millennial and in that generation X, they're facing this situation now where not only are they caring for their children, but they're also caring for uh, older parents. They're kind of in that sandwich generation. And then the additional pressures that came with the pandemic have really added some additional stressors that have perpetuated mental health issues. So these are three, uh, these are two good uh, pieces of information just to keep in mind when you think about uh, women as you start educating yourself. And June is Pride Month, and it's a great month to carve out time to learn about LGBTQI issues and becoming familiar with terminology around gender identity. And a lot of these, uh, these new terms that, we, that, are, that continue to evolve in the LGBTQIA space also have respective symbols that go along with them. You see some of those symbols actually reflected on the screen. So for example, these, these uh, symbols uh, symbolize uh, male, uh, asexual, intersex, non-binary, transgender, female, and get familiar with the distinctions in the terminology as well. And very closely related to understanding the language behind gender, gender identity, is also the use of pronouns. Pronouns are an important way to promote inclusivity and to demonstrate respect for our colleagues. So I've got a few examples here of some pronouns that are commonly used. And you may wanna ask yourself, what are your preferred pronouns? And it's always healthy to ask other individuals what pronouns they prefer to use when you address them. Another group of individuals who are typically marginalized and we don't talk about a lot are people with disabilities. And people with disabilities are now getting the, some of the attention that they deserve. You know, colleagues with disabilities need to be considered because most disabilities are also invisible. You know, before um, 
before we turn to the next topic, I just uh, want you to really think about that, how disabilities can be invisible. And if we don't take this into account, we can disregard a whole population of colleagues that really need our support as well. Uh, and the way uh, disability is being uh, categorized and defined even at the federal uh, level has been broadened to people who not only currently have disabilities, but may have historically had disabilities. So for example, perhaps you had gone through a period in your life where you suffered or struggled with cancer. And during that period of time, you were disabled. And maybe perhaps you're in remission now and you're fully capable, but because you, are, you were at one point uh, suffered that disability, it's recognized now by the federal government and federal legislation as well. So uh, before we turn to the next topic, I want you to ask yourself, what is one topic that you would like to research further and make note of? Make note of that in your handout if you have it available to you. Think about something that you would like to dig deeper into. Maybe it's one of the topics that I just uh, talked about, or maybe there's another group that you're very interested in and you want to learn more about, but make note of that. What is one group that, or one topic in diversity that you would like to learn more about? Tiffany, any questions or comments coming in? Yeah, um, one more thing I want to add too, since I didn't mention it at the very beginning, for everyone that's logged in, there is a handout in the handout section of your go-to control panel that you can use to take notes as Ellie is going through all these wonderful topics. Um, I wanted to share Ellie with you though, there's actually quite a few people who have sent in a chat relating to some of the things that you're describing, saying like, yep, mm -hmm, as a woman, I've experienced that in the workplace, how frustrating and talking a lot about the microaggressions and perceptions that people have. Great, glad to hear it. I'm glad that it's resonating. And mm -hmm. again, I could have one hour, two, three hour webinars on each of the groups that I just described because these are really interesting, evolving topics that if you want to be an ally, you can definitely dig deeper into. So I'm not doing these topics justice or these groups justice by just touching on them, but what I, I wanted to do is demonstrate that there is a lot to learn. So if you are willing and if you really do have the desire and the passion to be an ally, dig deep and you will find how each group struggles with its own individual inequities, and think and ask yourself how you can participate in helping to create opportunities and do away with barriers for these groups. Exactly, this is great, Ellie, thank you. Glad to hear it. So our next step in being an ally is to be aware. You now closely tied to being a learner is awareness. Two types of awareness are needed for effective allyship, awareness of self, and awareness of others. You know, being an effective ally requires significant levels of self-reflection. And that awareness includes teaching yourself to notice inequity, not just overt actions like when someone uses derogatory language, but also those subtle forms of unconscious bias or subtle forms of inequity, just as we talked about with the microaggressions. If some of us sit in meetings with large groups, you can just, instead of being so caught up in the topic, if you are allowed to, if you're allowed to just sit back during a meeting and just observe what's happening in the room. And if you're more observant, you will actually probably pick up on some of these micro inequities. For example, you know, female leaders, you know, particularly female leaders of color are often criticized more harshly and they receive personality based feedback instead of skills based feedback. Pay close attention to that. Why are we looking more at how women behave versus how they're performing? Whether you're a woman of color or not, this is often something that we as women struggle with. You know, marginalized group members have long noted a lot of these experiences, but oftentimes, if you're not already in one of these marginalized groups, you're not aware and you might miss these subtle signs of bias. But if you are made aware that these subtle signs of bias exist and that perhaps unwillingly you're actually perpetuating some of these, you might be able to stop things dead in their tracks and start creating room for things to change. 
So be aware of your own implicit biases. So as you work to be a learner, work to be aware and engage in some critical self-reflection about your own biases. So I'm sharing with you this link for the Harvard Implicit Associations Test. It's a great test, it's online, it's available to the public, but you can go online and take that test and learn more about your own personal biases. Whether you believe that you have them or not, we all have them. Even those of us who are from marginalized groups have our own biases. So stop and take the opportunity to learn about what those biases are. I, I remember uh, listening to a, a woman, her name is Verne Myers, and I actually have a, a quote that I'm gonna share uh, that she uh, has so uh, has, has, has shared with the world that has given us so much to reflect on. Uh, but she once shared how she got on an airplane and how uh, she heard the voice come through uh, the, um, the speakers and it was a woman's voice who said she was the pilot. And she remembers in that moment feeling uh, a sense of nervousness because she's so used to men flying planes that she thought to herself, well, if a woman's flying a plane, maybe we're in danger. <laughs> and here's a woman who's a diversity expert, African-American woman, and she herself learned in that moment that she had her own biases, right? And uh, she shared this during an open forum and you know it was an opportunity for some self-reflection. Obviously in that moment, she self-reflected, talked herself out of her bias in that moment. And of course she landed safely, but it was an opportunity to recognize that even someone that has a forward thinking perspective on diversity and inclusion issues even has biases. So take the opportunity to take this test online if you can and learn about your own biases. And you know, one of the things that I think we don't reflect on sufficiently is our own body language and our facial expressions, especially when we learn about something that we've never heard of before or when someone is sharing their, their experiences with us that we are not able to relate to. Be aware of what you might be communicating with your facial expressions and your body language you want to be able to communicate a level of empathy and you want to be able to communicate that you are willing to listen and learn. No, you're not always going to relate to what you hear, but your willingness to sympathize with the individual who has experienced a level of marginalization or struggle will definitely open the door for some bonding and also for opportunity for inclusivity. So again, be, 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 you know, pay attention to your facial expressions, your body language, strive to remain neutral and to become more aware of others, you know, ask yourself whether, um, whether you know the people around you. Uh, don't assume that every member of an underinvested community feels oppressed. So take the time to learn about someone's story. So to sum it up, to sum up awareness, you know, uh, remember to be aware of yourself through introspection and be aware of others through observation. And if you have your handout available or just a piece of paper, you know, answer the question, where and how can you become more aware of biases in yourself and in others? Tiffany, any questions before I move on to the third step? I don't necessarily have any questions, but there were some additional comments that came through when you were talking about that test. We actually had a couple of people say that they've taken that test and how eye-opening it was. So hopefully everyone else will get a chance to play around with that too and just check in with that because it's so easy to have them and not be aware of them. So this, again, it's just so wonderful. Great stuff. Absolutely. Glad to hear it. Mm -hmm. So now let's talk about the next step. The next step is to be inclusive. You know, allies play a pivotal role in creating an inclusive environment. Um, you know, the use of the right pronouns, as we talked about before, that invites people who use different types of pronouns into a conversation and helps them to feel like they are welcome. You know, if you're not sure about the kind of person you're talking to, then ask which pronoun they prefer to be called. You know, asking is a sign of care for the person that you're talking to. 
and it's a way to give them the space to feel comfortable with their identity. And do not dismiss or disrespect other people's contributions. Uh, this happens all the time in meetings sometimes, right? Uh, make sure that um, you're welcoming when others uh, show up at a meeting that might not typically speak up at a meeting or even people who are at the table who might not be at the same level in terms of a organizational structure. Uh, make them feel welcome, regardless or whether or not whether you agree with them even if they disagree with a point that they're expressing at a meeting. And this is another opportunity where we see that microaggressions often occur is when there's a level of disagreement. So welcome disagreement. You know, we succeed when we have different points of view at the table. That's what true diversity is about. It's not just about diversity of skin color, ethnicity, gender. It's also about diversity of thought. And our thoughts are often shaped by our backgrounds and by our personal experiences. And there's value in that. So when we disregard someone else's viewpoint, we're also disregarding them. So Think about how you can disagree with someone, but still empower them to continue to be able to voice their opinion. You know, you can say things like, I see your point, it's a new perspective to me, or I want to understand more, can you share more about your perspective? I never thought about it that way. Use that kind of affirming language that invites additional commentary and additional sharing of opinions invite diverse voices and perspectives into the conversation. And here's another thing. If someone is quiet during a meeting, ask them what they think. Proactively ask them what they think. Or if someone talks over someone else, women face this all the time, right? They get talked over during meetings. Make sure that you give the interrupted person the floor and ask them, tell me what you're thinking. Share your opinion. You know, ultimately, uh, this quote by Renee Myers, who I talked about earlier, really sums up inclusivity. She says that diversity is being invited to the party, but inclusion is being asked to dance. So don't just invite people to show up. Help them to dance. So in your handout or on a sheet of paper, just answer the question, where and how can you be more inclusive of those who are marginalized or who are underrepresented. So our next step in being an ally is to be a champion. You know, use your position to be a sponsor, not just a mentor. You know, a mentor is there to encourage and provide advice, and we all need mentors in our journey. But a sponsor takes it a step further. A sponsor is someone who actually has access to resources and opportunities and supports others to create opportunities for them. You know, I've uh, had the opportunity to chair a couple of committees uh, in my own career, and I always look for those people who have an opinion, who have a passion, who are underrepresented and probably wouldn't have had the type of visibility or exposure otherwise. And I try to turn over my, chair, my chairships over to them because I want them to participate. I wanna give them a platform. And that's been something that I've done throughout my career, is make sure that if I launch something, that I turn it over to someone who does not typically have the same platform that they would otherwise have if I wouldn't have provided them with that opportunity. So think about how you can create opportunities for, other, uh, for others. Um, another thing that you can do is to talk about the expertise that you see in others especially during performance reviews or promotion discussions. You know, recommend people for stretch assignments and learning opportunities and share their career goals with other influencers within the organization. Uh, invite members of underrepresented groups within the company to, to speak at staff meetings, to write for newsletters, or to take on other high visibility roles and opportunities. You know, another thing you can do is offer to introduce colleagues from underrepresented groups to influential people within your network. Uh, you know, be a champion. Bring others along with you, right? So you uh, being a champion means 
helping others, but then also bringing other allies with you, creating other allies. Provide those individuals with the same supports and tools that you're using for yourself to educate yourself, to help evolve your own points of view. Uh, this also means that you uh, walk hand in hand in the allyship journey with these individuals that you're bringing along, you know, teaching them about inequity and holding yourself accountable and others uh, for these higher standards that we're expected of our, that, are, that we're expecting of ourselves as allies. So in your handout or again on a sheet of paper, you know, ask yourself where and how you can be a champion for others. And how can you hold yourself accountable? Tiffany, any questions or comments? <laughs> Sorry, it's taking me a minute to get over to the mute section. Um, okay. No, yeah, I don't see any questions that have come through. Um, there were some comments though that came in earlier, even talking about um, how women have taken the bulk of like family care during COVID and the financial responsibilities too. I thought that was an interesting point that was brought up just a, a little bit ago in Absolutely. your discussion as well. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Great. So we're yeah. gonna move on to our fifth and uh, final step. And that step is to be outspoken. You know, use your position as an ally to communicate your stance as an ally and to vocally denounce inequity whenever you see it. This is a unique opportunity to educate others and it requires a level of courage. Uh, if we're not used to speaking out against inequity or even microaggressions, because they're called microaggressions for a reason, right? Because they're subtle. And sometimes pointing out something that is subtle can be awkward for us. Uh, I was I had the pleasure of working with a uh, an executive a C-suite executive a couple of years ago who was a real champion for women and he was proactive in making sure that he addressed bias or microaggressions but he was really diplomatic he wasn't about embarrassing anyone because remember some people might not be aware of what they're doing Right? They might not be aware that they're engaging in a microaggression or that they have some sort of implicit bias. So he was really good about paying attention to dynamics and meetings and then even pulling people aside after meetings and talking to them about what he observed and providing some advice as he, was, as he himself was learning and evolving on how, how they could be more encouraging and foster uh, more equity in the workplace. One of the things that I remember him pointing out during his Monday morning team meetings, you know, all the men would show up early, they'd pat each other on the back and they'd start talking about football because they were watching the game over the weekends. And a lot of women uh, would come into the room and sometimes didn't have a place to engage because some of them weren't into football. Uh, there are a lot of women who are into sports, but he recognized that there were a number of women on his team who couldn't contribute to the conversation because they weren't into football. So he made it a point to call them in on that and say, hey, no sports talk. Let's talk about maybe, hey, what did you do over the weekend, right? Which is a, a broader question. It's a more engaging question. It invites inclusivity, right? Where now we can try to find some commonality around maybe how people engaged with their families. It doesn't mean you can't say, hey, I watched the game, but it does mean that you don't allow it to dominate the conversation to the point where somebody feels excluded, right? So this is something to kind of think about is, you know, as an ally, be proactive in educating others. And again, it doesn't have to be something that happens inside of a meeting. It is, uh, you know, in front of others, it could be something where you just pull people aside and you have a conversation. You know, and when an ally takes on the role of a sponsor, they, they, they vocally support the work of colleagues from these underrepresented groups in all contexts, but specifically in situations that are gonna help those colleagues with their standing and their reputations within their organizations. So um, I wanna take this opportunity to say thank you so much for uh, giving me your ear today. Remember that as an ally, you are here to take action. You're here to open doors and take your own personal style into account and in how you do that. You want to be there to champion others and to create opportunities for them. 
and you don't want to do it in a performative way, which means you don't want to just say, I support this particular cause. You want to demonstrate with your actions that you support the cause. And I hope that I shared enough uh, advice today on what some of those actions can potentially be. And I am happy to just open up the floor and ask for some questions. Wow, thank you so much, Ellie. That was just a wonderful barrage and loads of information that I think everybody here on this call is going to be able to take away with them today and start to insert or input that into your daily lives, whether it's at you know your professional life or even your personal life too. I think it applies definitely for both. There were a couple of questions though that came up when you were talking about being outspoken. And one of the questions that came in is, is there a polite way to call out other people? Do you have an example of maybe a statement that you could say? Some others are saying that I've been told that I'm a little too outspoken sometimes, and maybe we could get some examples of some better ways to approach that. Absolutely. You know, I, I feel like a lot of these dynamics play themselves out during meetings, right? This is usually when we see uh, some of these microaggressions or some of these dynamics occur. So if you are in a meeting, for example, and I mentioned this example earlier, right? When someone, let's say there's a, a woman talking and perhaps somebody uh, takes over the conversation and speaks over that woman, uh, it's important to say to the, and let's say it was Bob, let's say Bob started talking over Sally and Sally didn't get to complete her point. It's good to just look at Bob and say, Bob, thank you so much, uh, but Sally, can you please finish your thought? and allow her to finish her thought, give her the floor to finish her thought. Uh, another dynamic that we've seen, and, and sorry, I use a lot of uh, examples when it comes to women because I'm a women's leadership expert, but uh, another dynamic that we see a lot with women is when women share ideas uh, during a meeting, and uh, then uh, people will ignore the idea, talk over it, and then a man will suddenly share the same idea and all of a sudden, it's like, wow, that was like a, you know, we're the genius behind what you just said. Uh, you know, it's it, it, that's an opportunity for even the woman who uh, shared the idea or someone who observed it as an ally to say, thank you so much for agreeing with me, right? If you're a woman and you decide you want to speak up for yourself, or if you're an ally, call it out and say, you know what, that's uh, really great. This is exactly what uh, you know Sally shared earlier. And perhaps uh, the two of you can talk about this a little further and continue to evolve the idea. But the point is to call out and to recognize the individual in the room who is um, being marginalized. And think about always doing it politely. The goal here is to create an ally of the person who is not aware of their own biases it's not to embarrass them, it's not to shame them. And I think that that's very important. Our goal here is to educate and to bring people into the fold so that we can change dynamics, not to shame anyone or to embarrass them. And sometimes that means that you wait after the meeting and you pull the person over to the side and you address them personally as well. Yeah, there's a lot of comments that are coming up just based off of the follow up from that about how often something like this happens. And there's even some examples of internal like experiences that have happened internally within guaranteed rate companies that people are noticing, too. So I hope that a lot of these suggestions that Ellie has provided will be some practices that we can keep in our back pocket, as I always say, and you can use those or tap them anytime when you see like something going on in a meeting. I think that's great advice that you've provided. So thank you for that. Glad to hear it. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, let's take a few more moments um, before we wrap up. We do have a few extra minutes before we wrap up our session. So if anybody does have any questions, this is a great time to bring those in on the question box of your go-to control panel. And in the meantime, while we're waiting for some questions to come through, you all can see that Ellie has her LinkedIn account, which is provided right at the bottom of her um, slide right here. 
I actually just connected with Ellie on LinkedIn as well. So you all can follow Ellie and I've already saw a bunch of great videos that you've provided on your LinkedIn account. So there's definitely more where this came from if you all are interested in getting more information from, from Nelly. Sorry, from Ellie. Um, okay. Well, wonderful. Well, I don't see any additional questions come through. Um, I guess, well, let me ask one thing for everyone in our group, because I always think this is interesting to, to see what did everybody hear like within the presentation? So would everybody get your fingers over on the keyboard? We're going to uh, start providing some responses. I would love to hear what is your biggest takeaway from today? Let's see what you all are hearing from the presentation. What is your biggest takeaway today? We'll wait for those to come through. Um, another thing is, uh, Ellie, we do have a question about that test that you mentioned earlier, providing a link for that. So maybe if you Absolutely. could provide the link for that test to Ella and I, and we can distribute it to um, to our people. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'll put that out. All right. Well, let's see what we have. We have uh, learning about our own biases. Mm-hmm. Create allyship that is respectful when calling out others. That's a good one. Mm hmm. As an ally, how to address these issues in office situations in parentheses, which for me is harder to navigate. Mm hmm. Uh, another one says it reminded me to show that intro video to my stepkids because it's such a great visual to show them the privilege they have. Mm hmm. Yeah, that's great. Um, the micro ones are the more subtle to be aware of. Yeah, that's a good point too, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Good. Well, that's wonderful. Well, um, let's see. I appreciate all of that. Um, there were some others that had come through. Here's another question. I think I actually might have overlooked it. There's so many chats that come through at the same time. Sometimes that I miss them. But here's another question to Ellie that we could address. How can we get people who should be allies more involved in talks like this? Like, for example, maybe men who can be better allies to what women experience in the workplace. That's just one example. Absolutely. And this is a question that I hear often. Uh, I think that um, often, especially white men, feel like they are left out of the conversation. And when we talk about diversity, sometimes they don't feel like they have a place in the conversation. So I think it's important that we acknowledge them and acknowledge the role that they play. And sometimes that means creating specific uh, programs to help men. Uh, there's a one a really great uh, speaker who's a colleague who does a presentation on white men are diverse too, right? That's one of her keynote speeches. Um, so creating that kind of an environment or uh, creating a men as allies program or a men as allies a day where you can have men come in and talk about diversity. And I, I've, I've launched those myself at the company that I work in and they've been highly successful. But what makes them even more successful is when you get one or two highly visible allies that co-host or host the event. That is super important. The higher up in the organization that you can go, someone who's highly visible and influential and people want to get to know that individual or want to get closer to that individual or want to uh, emulate that individual, if you can get that person to be a sponsor of allyship programs, you will uh, have more success. That's great. Yeah, there's a comment that came through just now too, saying, I love your statement that white men are diverse too. You know, I think sometimes it's um, easy to see it on the other the other side of that. Um, one more question, Ellie, we'll take, and then, um, you know, we can we can start to wrap up in just a little bit, and I'll leave everybody with some information that they can take away too. Um, but the next question is, how do you ensure that as a leader, that you create a safe space for allies to speak up? Hmm. Uh, you know, it, it goes back to the point I was making about inclusivity. Uh, and as a leader, uh, we bear a, an even greater responsibility to ensure that individuals feel like they are part of the conversation, that they have a seat at the table. And sometimes that means just going out of our way to getting to know each uh, individual uh, more closely and learning more about them and who they are. I had this one uh, leader um, who just a couple of weeks ago, actually, I attended her team meeting 
And she did something that I'd never seen any leader do before. And I've been in corporate America for many years. But she started her team meeting by just talking about herself and opening the floor for others to talk about themselves. And one of the things that she chatted about was how uh, when uh, you know, she chatted about her background and she chatted about how her background influenced her leadership style today. And one of the ways that it influenced her leadership style today is because she said that she often felt like she was out of the loop, like she didn't get the memo somehow. She didn't always feel like she belonged to anything. And as she talked about that, she talked about how it actually drives her leadership style. And she demonstrated a level of vulnerability about herself. She shared about her background and it opened up such a wonderful dialogue with, with her other um, teammates uh, because they all started to share. Like one of the members shared about a disability that he had. And as I mentioned earlier, many disabilities are invisible. You would never have known that this gentleman had struggled with a disability all his life and continues to struggle with a disability. But had she not opened the door for that, she he would have never had the opportunity to talk about that. And those those other individuals in the room would have never had the opportunity to know something very intimate about their colleague that makes them more, sen more sensitive to him and more sympathetic. But then also it makes them ask themselves, how can I be supportive of him, right? So if you as a leader go out of your way, one, to promote inclusivity, but then also demonstrate a level of vulnerability yourself that will allow the openness in the conversation, you can also bring other allies with you in the journey. Yeah, I think you people are very surprised at how much uh, contribution you receive when people do start to open up and kind of let the let let everything kind of let the bars down a little bit and just start to share things about their individual experiences. And then once that happens, it just kind of kicks in where everyone's like, well, I want to share too. I think that's just a, a beautiful experience to witness as well. Perfect. Good, good. Okay, well, wonderful. There's another good takeaway that says, my takeaway was the difference between equality and equity. That was an aha moment for me. Yeah, good, wonderful. Good. Well, Ellie, thank you so much for bringing your expertise and your experience with this topic to all guaranteed rate companies. We're grateful and thankful for you to be here. I learned a lot as well, so I'm, I'm thrilled that I got to be a part of it. Um, if anybody has any questions or ideas or even suggestions, you all know we're always open to that. These ERGs are here for you all in order to feel um, connected in a way that um, we want to provide more information and more webinars just like this. So if you do have any questions, please reach out to grow at rate.com or you can reach out directly to the ERG that you're mostly you know, participating with or interested in. And we can pull all of those ideas and thoughts and feedback together and um, keep creating some additional webinars on a monthly basis for all of you. So thanks everyone for coming in. And Ellie, thanks to you again. Thank you. And I'll see you all next month. Thanks, everybody.